Welcome to the Extra Connection. We are so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you took this time out of your busy schedule, especially during the holiday season, to jump on with us and hopefully learn a little bit more about how to help the kiddo in your life who has Down syndrome um, in the light of occupational therapy. And we are so excited to have a phenomenal occupational therapist on, um, Ms. Julie Williams. And so, um, Carly, I'll have you kind of talk a little bit about Gigi's, and then I'm going to introduce Julie, and then we'll go take it from there. Sound good? Perfect. Um, All right. Thanks. Hi, guys, and yes, welcome. We are so glad that you're joining us. Um, I see some familiar names on here, so I'm glad to see that you guys are back and um, some new names. And so, um, Gigi's Playhouse is a Down Syndrome Achievement Center. Um, we are located in Brentwood in Nashville, but there are locations all across the U.S. There are um, about 50 locations in the United States and one in Mexico City. So if you're not from Nashville, but you're on this call, there is probably a Gigi's close to you. And if you would like us to help you get connected with that Gigi's, we would be more than happy to do so. So just reach out to me and um, I can assist you with that. Um, we provide free and therapeutic and educational programs to um, individuals zero to adulthood with Down syndrome. Um, our programs were designed, they're designed from by therapists and um, special education teachers and people that just have a passion for um, working with individuals with Down syndrome. And so um, I know I've given this spiel on every call, but um, I just like to reiterate that Gigi's, uh, all of our programs are free and um, available to any families that want to get connected. Um, and since COVID happened, we offer virtual programs. So even if you aren't close enough to get to our brick and mortar location, you are always welcome to join our virtual programs. Um, and we break up these programs into different age groups. So for, we even have little pro programs for our zero to three year olds that include sign language and songs and um, just fun therapeutic activities to get uh, moms and babies connected, dads and babies, grandmas. Um, it's just a fun little part of the day that we like to do. Um, and Gigi's in Nashville started in 2013, but it has actually been around um, nationwide since 2003. And it Gigi started in Chicago by a mom who had a daughter with Down syndrome. And she was she had doctor's appointments and therapy services, but she didn't have anywhere that she could just go and talk to other parents of children with Down syndrome and somewhere for her daughter, Gigi, to um, just be herself and have friends that um, are just like her. And so she created Gigi's Playhouse, and um, it has been such a huge success for our families. And uh, my favorite part is just seeing the families connect and be able to share stories and share therapists and all of the things that are super important, especially at this young age. Um, so if you are new to Gigi's and want more information, I would gladly assist you in that. Um, shoot me an email. I am the one who sent out uh, the email with the meeting link. So just respond to that and um, I'll be happy to connect with you. And so part of our um, programs is we have a new program for our um, new family, new caregivers and expecting caregivers called the Extra Connection. And this program was started um, by Sharon, who is our program leader, and she felt the need, saw the need that families need to connect and um, it, just a safe spot where we can talk about things and share resources and um, just really be there for each other. And so I'll let you, Sharon, give a little bit more about the extra connection and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Sharon, and I am a parent to two kiddos, and one of them is three years old and does have Down syndrome. His name is Aiden. We moved to Tennessee specifically um, for all of the wonderful resources that are here. We came from Michigan, and before that, we were in Chicago. 
which is our hometown, our home city, where my husband and I both grew up. But we are here now and we couldn't be more thankful. And um, I have just found so much, so much uh, connection, joy, um, almost just like emotional therapy, just by being with other parents who are in the same season of life that I am going through. And so I have noticed that, especially during this virtual time where we're all trying to connect with each other, it's been really challenging. And so my hope is that with these programs that we're providing with the extra connection, that you feel like you're getting the resources that you want and you need into your hands. And um, and also we have other times where we'll be also doing some family connections. But right now, um, for today, we're focusing more on some resource-based stuff. And that's why we have brought on, um, we're so grateful for Julie, who is volunteering her time with us today. Um, she is a she is a seasoned pediatric occupational therapist. She has 13 years of experience, and she's worked in a variety of settings. She's worked in schools, and she's worked in therapeutic environments as well. Um, she has actually worked with Aiden in the past, and so I do have ex I do have experience working with Julie, and she's really um, championed Aiden's what is specifically what his needs have been, especially when it comes to sensory processing and fine motor work. And so I'm just really privileged to work with her. I'm really thankful. And um, we're so glad that she could come on today to just give us a little taste of what we can do with our kiddos, our young little guys um, with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Julie. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thank you so much, Sharon. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Um, as Sharon said, my name is Julie, and yes, I've been, a, uh, let me go to my next slide. I've been a therapist for 13 years now. Um, 10 of those years I've actually worked here in Nashville. We moved here in 2011 for my husband's job, and I worked at an outpatient clinic that also had an inclusive preschool attached to it. So, um, and we serviced children um, birth to 21. And before that, I worked in a school setting. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything. Most recently, um, just in September, I transitioned to full-time um, private practice where I'm actually going in homes and in schools to see children um, in their more natural environment. So right where they're at. And that's been very um, energizing and um, just kind of something different for me so um, it's been really fun seeing the kids in their homes and like what equipment they have there and and how I can assist um, just with very specific daily needs that the children have um, I'm from Arkansas so I went to school there I was born and raised there went to college there my first job was there then we moved here so um, that's a little bit about me I've worked with numerous Down syndrome children over my 13 years all of which have a special place in my heart because as you know, being their parents, they are just the sweetest little people um, and big people. I've had some of all ages, but um, they are just very special and um, just so much potential. So I hope that what I share today is helpful and um, we'll just get started. Then let me know um, if you guys have specific questions. I did do this PowerPoint based off of um, mostly geared toward birth to around four, five um, age. So if you have a kiddo that's outside of that age or um, a specific question for a certain age, please let me know. And a couple of okay, so I, just... I forgot to mention, Julie, I'm going to jump in oh, here sure. real quick. I'm so sorry. If questions come up, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat box and I'll try to kind of gently um, push them in there for you, Julie, so you don't have to um, keep track of the chat box if that's not easy to do. Um, and also, okay. I just want everyone to know that the audio here is being recorded, and so this will be posted to the to Gigi's YouTube page after the seminar so that you can go back and reference it or you can share it with a friend. But also know that if you want, if you're going to be sharing personal information, that this will be public. So I just want everybody to um, to know that. Okay, thanks. Take it away. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention in my um bio is I'm also a mom so I'm a mom to two amazing young boys um I have a five and a half year old that just started kindergarten this year and a 14 month old little boy so I may be referencing them in some part of this um just because they I talk about them often but I want you to know that I am also a mom 
Okay, so first things first is we have to figure out, or I'd like to um, at least share with you guys, what is occupational therapy? Because I get asked this all the time because it's confusing um, verbiage for how um, occupational therapy applies to a child. So I wanna start there. Um, so occupational therapy is called that because we're looking at a child's occupations. And so what are a child's occupations? Well, a child's occupations are number one, play. So do they have the skills um, necessary to play meaningfully within all their environments, across different environments? Um, play, then self-care. So can they complete um, daily life skill type things? So that's also an occupation. Um, and, just, and then just being friend, a friend to someone and knowing those appropriate social interactions um, is also one of their like meaningful activities that's part of their life. So we kind of look at the whole body and the whole system to see if um, if there's anywhere where we can help out to benefit um, those particular areas. So that's how it fall, that's how fine motor skills fall into it, sensory processing, visual motor, um, visual perception, um, self-care skills. So all of that is encompassed within a child's occupations. So that's kind of why we're called occupational therapy. Um, so the next slide is, what are some reasons that your child might be referred to an occupational therapist? And so some of these I just hit on, but if your child is having motor difficulties, so this would look like um, grasping type skills, bilateral coordination, using their hands together, um, things like that. Eye-hand coordination, so that is if your child, um, I like to describe it like, this is also another word for visual motor. So if you hear eye-hand, it can also mean visual motor. And so what that means is my eyes are telling my hands or my eyes and my hands are working together to do something. Um, if your child is having visual motor delay, so that's more, um, it's very similar to eye-hand coordination, but it brings in the handwriting piece. So drawing, printing, um, drawing shapes, coloring, that sort of thing. Visual perception is um, like, kind of like a puzzle type task, like can you can you um, shape match or can you perceive what shape you need to fit into a certain thing or figure ground type things, like can you find something in a drawer full of different things? So um, those just perceptual kind of skills. Uh, Self-care is also an area that we work with a lot. And so under this, uh, the, the big overarching things that we usually work on are dressing, feeding, using utensils, Time shoes, working on self bathing and grooming type tasks. Um, sensory processing is a big one, and we're going to hit on this later on in our slides. But um, that is, is your body interpreting the sensory information within your environment in a useful, efficient way, and then therefore you have appropriate output. So I know that was like crazy wording, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, also, decreased strength. So if your child is having just um, some decreased strength that plays a big role in fine motor skills um, and being able to do school and play tasks. Um, if your child has decreased range of motion, which generally in the Down syndrome population, I do not see this as an issue. If anything, it's, it's more the um, hypotonia, which is the lower tone that um, can impact their function, which we can talk about that too. Um, and then the last one is social difficulties. So, um, if your child is having difficulty interacting with others or following daily routines or things like that, we also work on that. Okay, so we're going to jump right into it. So I wanted to go over um, just these are very general OT milestones by age group. Um, and just a, a big key um, idea that I that I want everybody to keep in mind is that every child is different and every child achieves their milestones at different ranges, even typically developing children. So um, just keep that in mind. That this, these are just general guidelines, but um, something to kind of go off of. And then uh, just a good definition for fine motor skills. So if I'm referring to fine motor, those are skills that require the small muscle groups um, in your hand to work together. And so this is like the small muscles of your fingers, um, the use of your forearms, your wrist, your hand, things like that. Um, it's important that fine 
motor skills are important for dexterity and coordination. And we use those in everyday tasks all the time. And then visual motor is what I've previously described as um, using your visual skills, your visual perception skills and your motor skills all together um, in a coordinated and efficient way. Okay, so milestones. <clears throat> and I wrote these like, um, like the first one says by six months of age. So your child will, your child may achieve this within zero to six months. And it could be a little bit after two, but like by six months, you would probably start seeing these sorts of things. So the first one is emerging voluntary reach and grasp. So if they see something, they're re reaching out and they're trying to hold on to it. Um, I did want to break that down a little bit. Usually between four and six months, your child will begin to reach and maybe like grasp a rattle. Um, but before that, you can start placing a rattle in their hand. So if you put a rattle in their hand, they have, a, they should have a, a palmer reflex when they're born. And that's like the thing where if you put the, um, the finger in their hand or in their palm, their fingers will just wrap around it. And that's just a reflexive movement to try to teach them how to grasp. So you can try that. Um, and then if you place an item like a handled rattle or something, and if you rub it right here across their palm, you'll see their fingers come down. And you kind of want to just see if they can maintain a grasp or hold on for about 30 seconds. So that's a general rule of thumb. And then that's going to turn into more of a voluntary thing where they start to extend their arm and reach for something. And they still may need some help, but they're starting to then reach out and grasp. So there's a very, very beginning reaching grasping type skills. Um, you'll also start to see this. Um, I'm just saying, yeah, I'll say that part in a minute. Um, Okay, and then the next one is the palmer grasp. We talked about that. Visually tracking the object from one side of the face to another. So that is if they're laying on their back and you're shaking a rattle, they should be able to follow it, like start on this side and follow it all the way across. And they will move their head and their eyes as one unit, but you do wanna start seeing that visual tracking. And then they'll start to not move their head and they'll just start moving their eyes. And my general things, I don't take it wider than their head. Because if you start way over here, obviously they can't really do that without moving their head. But if you want to try just like from ear to ear, going across and then going back across the other way, that can really kind of jumpstart those oculomotor skills. Oculomotor meaning the muscles in the eye tracking something smoothly. Um, and then by six months, they should start bringing hands together to hold on to an object. So this is in supported sitting. So like sitting in your lap, if you put both their hands on an object or if they reach and grasp something from the tabletop, do they bring both hands to it and hold on? So this is a very important like beginning bilateral hand um, activity or like bilateral hand like strengthening kind of. And um, it's also a, a midline. So the kids, children are learning that they can, they have a middle part of their body. If you hear that word midline, that just means middle. So they start from just using one side, just using this side, and then bringing things together. So you can work on that by, you know, holding something up and seeing if they'll bring both hands to it. Um, hey, Julie, we have both a hands if you're interested. If sure. you, um, so our question is, are these milestones that are milestones that are for roughly for neurotypically developing children or are these milestones that are kind of broken down for kids who might have down syndrome and have some delays right so these are uh typical so neurodevelopmental just to so i wanted you to know them but keeping it because what was hard for me when i was researching all of this and per my experience is I don't ever want to put a child in a in a box or in a chart because um, even though they have downstream, that does not necessarily mean they're going to achieve all of these at a later date. It means they might. Um, 
and that we're going to be working towards these things. And so my goal today was to try to explain what each one of these are so that you can kind of facilitate that growth or like help that growth come along, but not necessarily, and, and not necessarily be um, married per se to the age, but to know that the progression of the skills should look the same. And it, and it varies by child and by, um, uh, the variability of what all is going on with the child, because um, I know children with Down syndrome can have other things that are affecting them as well, as well, especially if they have the heart stuff going on and if they're in and out of the hospital. Like, so it just it just depends. But these are general milestones for every kiddo. Um, so that's kind of how I read it. it. Perfect. Thank I you. I hope that that helps. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so then by their first year, so between six months and a year, you should start to see these this next set of bullet points. So the child will start isolating or pointing with their finger. Now I do see that this particular one takes a little bit longer for a child with Down syndrome, or that has been my experience. Um, it's just the finger isolation is a little bit harder, and they also really like to isolate their thumb. That tends to be the first digit that they isolate as opposed to the pointer. So if you start to see that, it's it's kind of common, in, at least in my um, experience, but you can also, we can also work on, um, again, facilitating the index finger. And we're, we'll talk about some ways to play and games to help that out here in a minute. Um, the next one would be reach and release. So that would be grasp and release type play. So that way if the child picks up like a smaller ball or a block and you say, hey, can you put that in my hand? And so they can reach out and actually put it in your hand. So they're learning that graded grasp and release and that eye-hand coordination of where to place it. That can also be container. Like um, I like to use bigger containers at first, not huge, but like um, kind of like a gumball machine or a shaped shorter bin. Not that they're putting the shape in the right shape, but that they're putting an object just in the bucket, if that makes sense. So they're learning um, grasp and release. Uh, pincer grasp starts to develop between six months and a year typically can take longer. You'll definitely see raking grasp come first. I didn't put that on here, but that typically occurs first where the child will just use all their fingers to rake something in their palm and then pull it up or pull it up and get it to their mouth. Um, so that's called raking grasp. And then the raking grasp transitions into a pincer grasp. So a pincer grasp is a thumb and a pointer opposing one another, and it's just with more precision. Um, a great way to work on this is during eating, if the child is motivated to eat. If feeding is an issue or if they're tube fed, then we can play other games to facilitate that. But um, So that would be pentagraph, and we'll talk about that more. Um, and if you have questions, we can talk about that. And then transferring an object from one hand to another. So what this looks like is if they're playing with a toy in this hand and they see another toy they want, they might take this hand, give the toy to the opposite hand, and then pick up another one. So that's called transferring. So they're learning that they have two hands and they can use both hands at the same time. And then clapping. So they're still learning about that middle part of their body um, and bringing both hands together. And then the child may start clapping around this age. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to two years unless we have questions on birth to one. Are these skills um, skills that tend to build on each other? Are th are they more like is it kind of like a pyramid? Okay, should should a parent be worried if they're not like happening like one after the other or um, <clears throat> if that makes sense? You know, uh, do they need does it have to be like yeah. in a timeline? Uh, <laughs> it kind of varies. Um, okay. If it's like um, a grasp and release, like so, so like that voluntary reach, reaching should happen before grasping and then and then releasing happens. So that kind of all happens in a pattern. Um, and then the raking grasp to the pincer grasp typically follows a pattern. Uh, transferring from one hand to another and then like clapping later wouldn't really um, like be big, like flashing, let's get some help signs, like that still may come. So it kind of depends on this, 
the system or like uh, just how things kind of flow together. Great. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So the two, by two years old, so between 12 months and 24 months, your child might be starting to do some of these things. And so that would be starting to show a hand preference. Um, I, I, this one with Down syndrome, I feel like is a little bit later. Um, and, and those of you that have children this age or older, be feel free to chime in. But from what I've seen, they tend, they tend to still use both hands for a little bit longer. Um, you can kind of start to see a hand preference. And the way that I like to tell is, um, if you were to put a, a crayon or a marker or a spoon or something right in front of them in the middle of their body, which hand grabs it first? So it, it doesn't work if you put it on a certain side of their body because then they're, they're typically going to reach for it with the hand that it's on that side. But if you put it right in the middle of them, which hand do they get like, you know, out of five times that you do it, out of five trials, which hand gets it the most times? That's a, usually an indicator as to which hand um, has the most preference. Um, also at this age, I don't have this on there, but the, if you're doing some scribbling, which is further down here, the grasp that you'll, the grasp that the child typically starts with is called a fisted grasp. So that's an upright fist, thumb wrapped around, like that's fairly normal when they pick up something and first start writing. And then the next grasp we want to get to is called a pronated grasp. The child will have a little bit more precision, so it looks kind of funny, and you're going to want to reposition them because it, the um, writing utensil is actually positioned under the hand. So it's in the palm um, with the thumb facing down, and then sometimes we'll even pull out, this is even better, if they pull out that index finger to kind of guide the writing utensil or the paintbrush or whatever they're using. And this is called a pronated grasp. You don't have to know that term, but that's what it looks like. And so it usually goes from fisted to pronated and it'll do, they'll start that from the first time they pick up the writing utensil until around age three, three and a half. They'll probably stay in this position. So if you see them putting it under their hand, that's totally normal. Um, okay, beginning wrist rotation to dump usually occurs here and I do really like to encourage that skill that's a really important skill especially for the Down syndrome community because these kiddos like to be in um I wore black today I'm so sorry you can't really see my arms but uh they like to have their arms turned <laughs> I still can't see my hand so their arms turn out a lot this is called supination um and pronation is important so this pronated um position is a little harder for them and it's because it requires a lot more shoulder stability and shoulder strength so here is easy because i'm not engaging my shoulder and my traps as much and if you have a kiddo with low tone um, and decreased strength then then this position is harder so we're going to talk about ways to strengthen too and games to play for that but just know this is pronation and this is why i like to encourage a lot of container play with pouring so you can see my hand so like pouring water especially like in a in, during bath time play or a water table play or even container play like you get those big um like rubbermaid containers like a big bin mm -hmm. and a little bin and so you're having a scoop and dump or um, any of your like dry sensory play works well um, just with scooping and dumping a container play. So you're just working on wrist rotation. You're, you will probably see them try to do this. <laughs> so they're going to dump it backwards or a lot of my kiddos will hold with both hands and dip it toward them. Um, and so really what we try to encourage is maybe put something in this hand so that they're not using both hands. So maybe they have a scoop in this hand and they're holding the little cup and they're really working on the pronation part of dumping. Okay, I hope that I kind of went off course. Sorry about that. But um, definitely, I think it's just it's it's good to know how you're saying that all our that kids with Down syndrome typically have some kind some some degree of hypotonia, and that is the low low muscle tone, and that mm -hmm. isn't you know that depending on the amount of Muscle, muscle tone that a child has, they may be trying to compensate for that 
by mm -hmm. moving their butt, moving their arms or moving their hands in different ways. And over time right. that won't, that, that could hinder them. And so the idea is to hopefully help them be, to help increase strength in different ways. You know, like you were, it hurt, you know, you were saying shoulder strength and that mm -hmm. was something that I was, I always thought was really interesting that you shared with me. I've never thought of that as a parent. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, the shoulder, you know, well, yeah, that, that whole, that connects and totally has so much to do with everything that the hand does. And that was, that blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know it's already 7.30, so I'll try to start moving faster because you guys probably have some questions. But um, just to, to uh, maybe piggyback on what Sharon was saying, which is something I was going to get to a little bit later, is um, so fine motor skills, even though we're talking about the little the hand, fine motor skills actually start way back in your scapulas, in your back muscles, and in your core. So in your, your abdominals and your back. So I always start my treatment sessions um, assessing that and also addressing those things through games because you cannot have good fine motor precision out here in your hands and in your little muscles if you don't have stability in your big muscles, so in your shoulders and in your core. If they're working so hard just to hold themselves up upright, and that's from the core strength, or to stabilize the shoulder, then they can't have precision out here with those little hands. So that's why that part is so important. And I think oftentimes not talked about. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on because I think the rest of that by two years is kind of self-explanatory. The only other thing I might mention is um, like the simple puzzle is like maybe just a really simple shape puzzle, like three, not like not more than three pieces on the grid because if we start to do that, it's visually kind of overwhelming. And I like to use the large knob at this age because the large knob really builds the um, the intrinsic muscles in the hand, those little palmer muscles out here. And I use the large knob mus the large knob puzzle first, and then a little bit later switch to the small knob puzzles um, because those will help with the pincer grasp. Um, so the child starts scribbling. They also start making strokes. So you're going to look for vertical lines or horizontal lines first. Um, and they may start um, hopefully doing some self-feeding. And this is not with utensils, this is just with their hands. Okay, then by three, they um, could start string beads. One note here is just to say, um, this is hard for kids with Down syndrome because strings are just so kind of flimsy and hard to feel in their hands. And that's partly due to that, that hypotonia, because if you actually, if you have hypotonia, you also have decreased proprioceptive sensory um, feedback. And that's a humongous word. And I'm gonna explain that more. Um, <clears throat> so I guess before time, I'll just jump in and explain proprioception. It's on a later slide, but let's just talk about it really quick. So proprioception is the way that your joint receptors feel input. So the best way I like to explain this is if you were to jump up and down and land flat footed, or like if you were to do a jumping jack, as soon as you stop, your your feet feel kind of tingly and you actually tune into, oh, there's my feet. That's your joint receptors. And that's called proprioceptive feedback. So you have joint receptors all over your body and all your big joints. And my kiddos with, uh, and your kiddos with Down syndrome, because they have lower muscle tone, they don't feel things the same as we feel them. They need things a little bit harder or a little bit stronger to then feel it. Um, so because of that, all of these fine motor things that we're asking them to do, especially as things get smaller and smaller and like lighter in weight, it's harder for them to feel. So um, even jumping ahead a little bit more, when they start using utensils, I like to use utensils that have a little bit of weight in them when I'm teaching spoon feeding or even with a fork because then they can feel it. Um, if you give them those the little plastic, really thin, like baby spoons and forks that are like, I mean, they're like super flat and thin, it's super hard for them. So I really like using more of the built up handle ones and even um, like the one that I have, I think upstairs is um, a metal with a metal spoon, but a plastic handle, but it's kind of built up and I forgot the brand of it. I'm so sorry, but um, so a little bit built up so that their little hands can get around it, but also has some weight in it to help them fill it. So although I went on that tangent because we're talking about stringing beads, this is an important skill because it's 
not because they're beating, but it's because they're learning how to use both hands together and to use their eyes to make something go on, like target. So they're using eye visual targeting to get something on. Um, so a way to make this easier is to use pipe cleaner because it's stiffer, they can feel it. I, I've even taken two or three pipe cleaners and twisted them together to bulk them up to make it bigger and then use large wooden beads just to teach that little skill. Um, then snipping with scissors. This is also one that kind of occurs around age three. Lots of parents are like, oh my gosh, I don't give my kids scissors at all. Of course, you don't have to, <laughs> but um, you can start with tongs, like little tong play. So anything that would help the child do this movement is going to be a pre-cutting activity. So this could be clothespin play. You could use chip clips just to use, just to move, like whatever you have around your house. Like if you have little cotton balls or little pom-pom balls, you guys could clip those and move them into a container. And um, a lot of kids love this kind of play. I know it, sound, it sounds kind of silly to us maybe, but they really like this kind of container play. Um, I've even used like ice cube trays before where we move pom-pom balls into um, an ice cube tray. And so those individual little spots help too with that visual motor and with that eye-hand coordination because they're the container compartment is getting smaller than like a larger cup. Um, so any kind I of actually have a, I have a quick a comment too to to just add to what you're saying yeah. to anybody if anybody feels discouraged thinking about how their kid might put things in their mouth that was Aiden that is yeah. Aiden right now and so um you know, if one thing isn't, you know, if you hear a suggestion and you see a really good idea on Pinterest and you, you're like, oh man, that's not going to work because my kiddo A, B, C, D, try, you know, try not to feel too discouraged and try to think, try to get creative and think of a different way that maybe they can tackle something. Um, you know, like for instance, I, their pom-pom balls all over Pinterest or all over and such so many great fine motor play. And I knew that just wouldn't work for Aiden and because he just he just loves to put them in his mouth. But that's OK, because there's there's lots of other things. And, you know, just to kind of try and not get too discouraged and take deep breath and think of something else that might work as well. Um, and just wanted to throw that out there. So hang in there. Yes. Um, totally. And yes, pom pom balls. I mean, all kids like to be like, oh, that's red and that's brown. Let me put that in my mouth. So, yes. So it definitely has to be a supervised task. I also tell um, my families to try, like if it's okay, ha let the kid have a snack while you're playing these games. So if they have a goldfish in their mouth or you know a pretzel stick, they're less likely to stick that pom-pom in their mouth. That may work, it may not work for your kiddo, but it might be an option. Um, okay, and then at four years old, We we're talking about uh, removing a twist cap. So they're starting that by four. So between three and four, this might start to emerge. Um, and this is a nice wrist rotation type of, it's an easy activity to throw in the air. And you can use, you can recycle like old spice jars. So if you run out of a spice and it's plastic and it's got a good lid on it, just throw that in there or vitamin jar or something like that. Um, Building a tower, the only reason that is on here for milestones or the reason that people look at that is because it actually is requiring that shoulder stability that we've been talking about to um, have your arm uh, out above gravity and in a very, and you're putting a block and grading your pressure. So your body is figuring out how hard or how soft you release the block not to knock down the tower. So um, that's why that's on there. And then usually by four, they're starting to copy a circle. So first is vertical lines, then horizontal lines, and then you start to see circular scribble where it's a continuous circle. And then by four, that turns into a circle with an end point. The reason that's important, it's a very important pre-writing skill because they're learning to watch their hand and tell their hand when to stop. If you're just doing scribbles and scribble, 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 your eye is generally watching the paper, but it is not watching your hands precise movements. And you have to have that skill in order to have writing. Um, so begins to copy a circle and then also imitates a cross. So that's important because they're trying to intersect lines and, and cross um, the midline. Um, okay, and then you also will see um, them start to stabilize things or bring in a helper hand so that if you guys are playing then maybe encourage them 
um, if you're coloring with them or whatever, to bring that other hand up and stabilize the paper, like hold the paper down so it doesn't wiggle or give the other hand a job because that's going to be important during cutting and also during writing when they move on. And then there's five and six on here too. I don't think a lot of you have this age group, so I'm going to kind of leave that so that we can get to some other things. Um, I put this um, pyramid in here because I just wanted to touch on kind of what we've already touched on. Um, that th this is like a, a pyramid of uh, gradation of um, that everything builds on one another. So if something within the pyramid is um, having difficulty or uh, just has a different, uh, is not but like within the sensory system, if something isn't processing as efficiently as another system, then it's going to impact everything. Because if you see, learning is at the very top. So that would be, you know, all of the things we have to do um, at school. So at the very bottom is sensory processing. So that's the first two um, levels. And then we have sensory motor. So that is our motor skills and our sensory skills working together to help us have postural stability um, and motor planning, which is figuring out how to move your body to do something. So this would be like an animal walk or um, motor planning, like getting around on the playground. How would I climb up this fort or things like that? So that's like figuring out a plan for how you're gonna move your body. Um, the next tier would be that oculomotor control. So those eye muscles working together and the eye hand coordination, all of that comes into play, visual perception then you get self-care, then you get academics. So I kind of just wanted to give you like why it's important to have a good foundation, why it's important to start early intervention if it's, if it's needed, um, so that you're building a really strong foundation so that your child um, will get to that upper tier maybe a little bit easier. Okay, and then we'll fly through this. So these are just a few play strategies that I threw up here. Some of them we've talked about a little bit um, here and there, but I wanted to go all the way back to um, those milestones that we talked about from birth to one. So one option that I like to use for Down syndrome kiddos is sometimes it's hard for them if they're laying on their back to reach against gravity and reach up and play with something up here because it takes a lot of strength to reach up against gravity that's wanting to push you down. So if your child is having trouble doing that, reaching out and sustaining their arm above their head to play, then it, an easier strategy would be turning them into their a sideline position or posture. So that would be just gently rolling them to their side. You can put a pillow behind their back to kind of prop them there. Um, be aware of their hip alignment because you don't want their hips to be out of alignment when they're in the sideline posture. Um, and then you would put, so if they're laying like this, you would put a toy right out here. Then they're not reaching against gravity and they're just having to isolate that one hand or arm to play and work on those visual skills while they're playing. And then you could switch sides and do the other side. So that's a way maybe you could start it if your child is having a hard time reaching up against gravity. Um, tummy time, tummy time's really important, but a lot of kids, um, don't tolerate it very well and don't like it, but it's important, really important to develop the neck muscles. Um, and that in turn helps with the ocular motor control and, um, and all those back muscles, that core strength that needs to be there to develop fine motor um, skills. So some things that we can do for tummy time is try it in a variety of places and positions. And you may have already heard this, but um, a lot of parents say that the, their child will tolerate it laying on their body. So if you lay the child on your tummy or on your chest and you incline yourself, as much as they'll tolerate, try that. At least try to get them to hold their neck up off of you a little bit. So you could always start there and then work your way up. Um, vestibular input was on our pyramid. So that's part of that very bottom sensory, um, one of the sensory systems. And... Um, it's a huge system, and I know we don't have time to really dive into it, but in, in short, it's um, movement through space. And the reason this is important is it teaches the child and the body um, spatial surround and environmental awareness and um, balance reactions. And just it's just it's really, really important. And the reason I put this on here is because kids with Down syndrome do sometimes 
reach their gross motor milestones a little bit later than other kiddos. So maybe rolling and sitting and crawling come a little bit later. So, um, and that's okay. But we can, we can um, help this vestibular system start progressing um, earlier, even if the child isn't doing gross motor movement through space. So if they're not rolling on their own, we can facilitate that movement. So if you think about it rolling, they're getting rotational input um, into their body or into their head. So let me back up. Vestibular input has to do with the way that the fluid in your inner ear moves around your inner ear canals. And so that fluid moving through your inner ear in all different directions um, through all the different canals, that is what it that is what tells your brain where you're at in your spatial environment. So it's important to get the head out of just upright because we usually just go through our day in the vertical position. So we're going to try to target um, lying down, rotation, um, upside down. So if you kind of want to just horse play with your child and dip them upside down, all that parents have been doing forever it is actually very important. Um, I put it on here like you could try swinging so that they're laying down in a blanket or a towel if, you know, mom and dad can both hold the towel and you guys can gently swing and sway if the child tolerates that. That's great. That's some really nice movement through space without the child being in a swing and not saying that swings are bad. Swings are okay. But if you want to get the child where they have a little bit more um, like freedom of the body and they're not just tucked in somewhere and they can really feel things. If you have time to try that, then that's a good thing to try. Um, rotation, so that would be like um, if you have an office chair and you get to the child in your lap or hold them um, even laying down and just do a very slow, please do it very slowly, like maybe one revolution, just so they feel that movement and that rotation. And that would be especially important if the child's not rolling yet. Um, and then a head inversion upside down play. I think I, I talked about that and just kind of dipping them and letting them feel that movement. Um, yeah, if you have more questions about that, please let me know. Proprioceptive input, we kind of already talked about. So that is the joint receptors. So ways that we can give them more information um, into their joints is by doing a lot of weight bearing activities. This is also really good strengthening activity. So it kind of does a both and. It gives them proprioceptive information and also a lot of strengthening into the shoulder and into the hand. And any weight bearing is gonna build the palmar arches that they need in their hands for all those grasping skills. Um, so this would be um, like holding your child in a wheelbarrow position, which can feel uh, natural for sure at first. Um, and some kids might try to fight it too, but uh, in my experience, if you make it super fun, they tend to catch on and start to like it. Um, and definitely with Down syndrome kiddos, I would modify this and hold them at their hips, not at their ankles. So I'm so you would put both hands flat, and, and you can even do this with a kiddo that's like right out a year old. You can start really young. So put both hands flat and then pull their hips up and maybe just have them reach for something or hold them in that position for a minute and sing a song or something like that. But at least they're getting some weight through their arms and through their shoulders. Um, if they're a little bit older, you can try the wheelbarrow where then they start propelling their arms to maybe go grab a toy. Um, and you make it a little game, then you run it back and throw it in a bucket or whatever you want to do. Um, pushing and pulling is also good. So, um, and then carrying something heavy if you want to make them the helper and they're helping you carry something. Um, if you have one of those little tool benches or something like that, if they are putting it in and then hammering, hammering, you know, is getting a lot of um, joint input through those joints. Um, and then jumping, if they're old enough to do that, they can't jump yet, hold them at their hips and do kind of an assisted jump and just make it kind of fun. Um, also, really quick note, vestibular and proprioceptive input are, are great to do as a preparatory activity. So what I mean by that is doing that first and then asking for the fine motor or the visual motor um, play or activity, because then you're kind of warming up the body and preparing the body for a more challenging task and giving the body information that they'll need to um, perform the next task. And then scapular strengthening. Scapular strengthening just means shoulder, but it's all parts of the shoulder and all the muscles that attach to the shoulder. And so you can strengthen those through weight bearing activities. Um, 
Or if your child is anti-weight bearing, you can do vertical surface play. And what I mean by that is putting something up, um, like probably eye level where they're having to reach out and grasp it or reach out and play with it. Because even though they're not putting weight through their hand, they're reaching up against gravity and holding that there. So if you think about it, even if like, if you and I were to do like arm circles and you do them forever, you have zero weight in your hand, but you're holding your hands up, your arms up against gravity and it makes you tired. <laughs> so um, a little bit of that is great. And you can do that um, like some games out there are like putting contact paper up and you can stick things to the contact paper and kids think that's fun or even pull them off. That would be even some more grasping type strengthening. Um, little squigs, if you've seen or heard of those toys, um, are fun. You can stick those to windows or refrigerators or um, glass doors, whatever you have, mirrors, and see if they'll reach up and kind of pull those off or stick them on. Um, if you don't have any of that, sometimes foam um, letters or shapes, if you dip those in water, they will stick to like glass or mirrors. Um, you can even do, if you want to just put a piece of paper on the wall and do stickers, do sticker play and stick stickers up there or pull them off. Um, so anything in the vertical, um, vertical surface play is good for scapular strengthening. Uh, okay, core strengthening. Um, there's lots of games you can play for core strengthening. Some I just put on here, like if you have a yoga ball, having the child sit on the yoga ball, you hold them at their hips and you can play, you know, go backwards and pull back to sit. You can play side to side, but even having them, or even just sitting sometimes for some of our kids, just sitting on a dynamic surface like a ball is hard. So maybe just sitting there and singing one song and, and you're stabilizing them or holding them at their hips um, to give them a, a little bit of help, but then they're having to use abdominal and back um, muscles to hold themselves upright. Um, and the hopping animals, I don't know if y'all have seen these, but my son has, we have one here and I use them in the clinic all the time. Um, and they're those little animals that you straddle sit on them. So one leg on this side, one leg on this side and they can hold on and it can bounce or even just sit, but it gives a dynamic surface that requires a lot of core strength. Um, hand strengthening. So these are some fun toys um, that you can play or ways you can do this. You can do this in the bath with those animal squirters um, that you fill with water and just have them squeeze it out. So that's a great way to do hand strengthening. Any wind up toy um, could be fun for that too. Some of them are bath and some of them are like walk across the table. Um, digging in putty or play-doh, lots of play-doh manipulation. Um, I know Sharon is great at making her own Play-Doh because Aiden can be a little bit more oral. So that's always an option if you have a kiddo that um, likes to put things in their mouth. Um, clothespin or tong play, which we talked about. There's a ton of different types of tongs out there. I would just encourage you to try some, some different ones and see which ones. You want it to be a little challenging, but not so challenging that they're frustrated with it. Um, and for my little guys, I like to find wider ones. So not the super skinny ones. So wide, almost like, um, like a mini kitchen spatula works really well. Or my kiddo upstairs, we have a um, play kitchen that came with a mini spatula and it's the perfect size because it's kind of wide on the handles and then the spatula part that he can get his hand around and squeeze. Um, so that kind of stuff is good. Um, uh, pop lock beads or snap lock beads. Those are the, the almost like a bead chain that pop that interlocks or locks them together. And one thing I didn't put on here is a, um, I call it a pop tube. It looks like an accordion, but if you pull it apart, it has a nice um, auditory kind of sound and a tactile feedback thing. So pulling and pushing those can be fun and hand strengthening. Um, ball poppers are those little animals where you insert the ball into their mouth and then you squeeze their belly and the ball pops out. And so kids usually think that's a lot of fun. They can be a little, um, like if you get the ball too far in the mouth, it won't pop out and all that kind of stuff, but you could try it. And then trigger toys are great too. The trigger toys are great for pre-cutting and or hand strengthening. And what I mean by this is like maybe bubble guns where you have to squeeze the trigger to make the bubble come out um, or a little mini water spray bottle. I use these all the time. Um, have the kids help you spray the house plants or go outside and spray the bushes or spray the tree or in the bathtub, spray the bathtub. But um, little water bottles are great. Um, the mini ones are great, are really good for Down syndrome kiddos because their hands are smaller and it's, the mini ones are easier to get their hands around it. The other ones are a little bit too wide. 
And then, oh, for my boys or girls, a toy drill. Like the, they have all kinds of little drill, screw kind of play things right now. And so that would be a good one too. Um, going back to my little guys with that grasp release, if you're releasing object into a target um, for the first time, sometimes like if you're playing shape sorter or, um, uh, or even something else, if it has a lot of different holes, sometimes that's frustrating. So I would, you know, scale it back a minute and um, maybe cover everything but the circle and only give them the circle and then see if they can get it in. And then once they're successful and you get that yay moment, then they may try the other ones. But um, don't be afraid to like cover some holes and isolate only one. Or another way I like to do it in the very beginning is taking something like a little, like a ball, like a medium sized ball and cutting a hole in the top of a coffee can or an oatmeal can or um, a tennis, uh, tennis ball container. I like those because they're clear and see through. And so having the child then isolate just that and target that and drop it in and they can see it drop in, especially on the tennis ball container. Um, that seems to be really motivating and teaching that grasp release skill. Um, pencil grasp. So lots of ways to work on pencil grasp, but one a fun way is like putting a sticker on a tabletop, but leaving just a little bit um, up and showing them how they can pinch it and then pull it off. So pulling stickers off or pulling off tape. So you can use um, this way like painter's tape or the brightly colored kind of tape that's not super sticky. Uh, one game you've probably seen all over Pinterest is they, they play, um, oh, what is it? Like rescue the animal or something where they put a little play animal in a muffin tin thing and cover it with tape. And so they have to rescue the animal by undoing the tape and getting the animal out. Um, so that can be a fun way to play it. Um, or for me, if we're, if you're doing it during, if you're working on pentagraphs during mealtime, if they're eating a, a goldfish or a veggie straw or something like that, um, if veggie straw, you'd break it in half for this. But if, if you had a goldfish, then I would hold it in my pincer and present it to them that way because they can't grasp it from me. You can't get it using a raking grasp. It's really hard. So usually when you present it this way, you'll see them start to isolate and take it from you. And so I'll do that a few times and then lay it on their tray and then see if they can generalize that and start to do it from the tray. And if they can't, I'll just go back to presenting it again. And sometimes you just present five or six at a meal time and then let them be and then the next time try it again. So um, that can just be a way to work on that too. Um, okay, I think that's mostly it. Uh, question. Sorry, yeah, it took almost the whole time. That was a lot of information. Thank you so <laughs> much. I loved it. No, you know, it's um, it's so it's it's so much information. But I think especially that we have this. You remember, we have this uh, presentation will be saved on, in an audio format, and you can access it any time. Um, that you want it um, at the on the GGG2 page, or I'm sure that there are some people like you know quickly taking notes and doing that. Um, so just know that there, this is chock full of information. But um, I had written in the chat box, you know, um, that we don't have to. We are our parents first, and that we our job is to connect with our children emotionally, as you know and to be there first. And these are some tips and things that you can do with your child, but it is not a, an exhaustive list of things to check and to do and to tally through. Um, but there are some awesome yeah. suggestions yeah. that you shared with us. Um, is If you guys have any questions for Miss Julie Williams, please make sure that you put them in the chat box now. Um, otherwise, I am gonna go ahead and grab a couple questions that came in through the form that Carly had shared earlier um, with us. Um, so let's see here. So my our, one of the questions is, when should, should we request services beyond early intervention? Should all children see some kind of pediatric developmental specialist? I'm guessing in the occupational therapy light. What do you think? Uh, I, I mean, I think it, dep it depends on your, your kiddo and maybe your concerns. So, I, I mean, at any point, if you have concerns or if you just want to 
see how they're progressing. It's never bad to um, have a professional take a look, uh, would be my opinion. Um, even if they don't need direct intervention, they uh, most therapists will probably give you ideas of things like these are next things to be looking for, mm -hmm. or here's some ways to work on these, um, like maybe a home program. So if they don't need direct intervention, they could at least kind of guide you and point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, so it's never, a, a, I don't feel like it's a, it would be a bad thing ever to, to seek out, um, a, a, an opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not sure all the different states that people are coming from, but for instance, um, my experience in Michigan was very different from my experience in Tennessee when it came to early intervention, early intervention, uh, in, in Michigan was we were assigned, um, an occupational therapist assigned a physical therapist assigned, and then we had our services that way. But in Tennessee, um, we had our option to to almost pick a, a therapist that we would be working with, and then early intervention covered that for us with that therapist. So we used, mm -hmm. so we were able to use therapists that um, we connected with, and we had a ch we had choices. So um, I'm not sure if that person might have been saying that because they might be coming from a different state. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So somebody has a question about tongue pro protrusion. With that, is that is that something that you? I can't remember if that's in your wheelhouse or or yes or no. Or <laughs> <laughs> It is not in my personal wheelhouse. Some occupational therapists take additional classes on um, feeding issues and oral motor issues. That is not me per se. Um, and in so yeah, in Tennessee, some occupational therapists do that. A lot of um, speech and language therapists um, actually deal with that um, because they specialize more in feeding and oral motor um, mechanisms. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you have any um, tips on teaching skills for independent cup drinking? So we have a person that's working on uh, cup drinking with their kiddo, and um, right. they yes. I, do you I have saw that, but is it a ten month old? A is ten it, month old. Did they say is, ten months? Yes, ten months old, and with a small like weighted cup called an easy peasy cup. Um, I've seen also, those. I haven't used one personally, but I have seen them advertised, and I thought they were interesting. Um, I, I think that would be hard maybe for a lot of kids. Um, so I would just encourage to definitely keep introducing and trying, but maybe not to be frustrated if they're not getting it this soon because it sometimes comes a little bit later. And I would also be interested to know if they had tried a straw cup. Um, I prefer straw cups over sippy cups um but yeah i just wonder if they have tried that too so yeah i i you know i um especially with aiden i was i'm so big on like independence and so i feel like i really can relate to this person because i remember we gave him that almost that same cup really early on and um we're still working yeah. on open cup um, but we okay. we do a little bit of both. We do a little bit of the open cup, but we also do some of that straw work as well. And I yeah. guess I would encourage that parent, if you know, like remember that when they're coming and they're bringing hands to their cup to drink, that it's not just their hand work, but that it's coming from muscles that is all built in yeah. through, yeah, shoulders, and, yeah, shoulders. with everything we talked about yeah shoulders and core and so they're having to stabilize everything and their jaw to get the cup um and that's maybe why i would start with straw or really do the straw a little bit more too because the straw is really going to strengthen those cheek muscles all that um, sucking is about the tone in the cheeks um yeah. so that's why i think that's good. yeah definitely don't give up but you know just know that that yeah, yeah. there's some other things to help underneath that underneath just what you yeah. see in the cup you know there's more to the well also having a, a place to stabilize the feet as well when your child is drinking is also really important too i'm so glad you said that that's exactly right yeah just uh, and that's something i meant to hit on it throughout the slides but in order to have fine motor control you have to have body stability um and so you, you yeah you can't have 
you can't work out here unless everything else is stable. So if you do have decreased strength or if your child is having trunk, um, if child has trunk weakness that you're working on, then when you want to work on a fine motor skill, I would have them in supported sitting because you can't expect two hard things to happen at one time. So, um, so if you're working on core, then work on core, maybe in the floor. But if you're working on fine motor and they need some more support, then put them in their high chair or um, in a place or in your lap to where they're really supported and then they can work um, and be more successful with their fine motor skills. Definitely. Um, I have a, a general question at the end, but there's a couple specifics that have come into our chat box. Do you have any suggestions okay. for a kiddo who grinds their teeth? We have a six month old and somebody else also has um, a person, who, a kiddo who's grinding their teeth at two, two and two and three quarters. <laughs> so um, okay. any suggestions? Yeah, I can old is right. How many teeth does the six month old have? That's, that's incredible. That's um, true. Wow. <laughs> Which is a good point to know. note that kids with Down syndrome, their teeth come in, they tend to come in later. Um, and that's yeah. not, to, yeah. don't be concerned about that um, if they're coming in a little bit on the later side, just throwing that out there. Yeah. So first, let me tell you why it happens, because if you understand it, that, that can help, uh, I think, sometimes. So it's all going back to the lower tone. Um, so they're grinding to feel like they're getting more intensity by grinding their teeth together because when they chew, they don't get as much input into their jaw muscle. So the jaw is a muscle just like the rest of your body that um, that we give input to and that we work out. And so that's why, like, so in, for instance, if a child is grinding their teeth, I would say do a lot of straw sucking, or if they're able to suck through a straw, then give them a more resistive cup or they're working harder to suck through that straw because then they're gonna be getting more input into their mouth and then therefore maybe decreasing some of the teeth grinding. Um, also, there's a ton of uh, chewy things out there, like chewy necklaces and resistive chewies, if you research that. Sometimes those work and sometimes they don't. Um, so, like some kids just take to them and some kids don't at all. They'll chew on it for a second and then just throw it. So, I would say sucking. Um, and then, if your child is eating, not too feeding or not having feeding difficulties, um, really looking at what foods you're giving them. And if they're able to manipu manipulate a really resistive chewy food, mm -hmm. trying to space those out throughout their day um, so that they're getting that input and little spurts through their day. So, uh, and, and by resistive or chewy food, I would think of something that like, if you were to eat it yourself, like you have to chew for quite a, you know, for a minute or two to like break that thing down. Or like, I like to think of like, if I suck a milkshake, you know how tired your cheeks get after you suck a milkshake or a smoothie that's really thick. So think like that, like something that's going to make those muscles work and um, suffice that, that need that they're trying, that they're seeking. That's great advice, absolutely. Um, any suggestions for OT strategies when a child has oral sensory difficulties? This person writes, swallowing is fine, but anything coming to the face is a no-go. The child is almost three years old. Okay. Um, I would wonder if that child also has tactile defensiveness, like other... Um, like they don't like to touch things with their hands or things like that. Usually oral and tactile run together from my experience. Um, <clears throat> because even though this is one part of our body, our body is still systemic, meaning it all kind of works together. So I would, that's a hard one to answer just via question. I would love to see this child and figure it out, like what exactly is going on. But uh, you could try, um, maybe just deep pressure to the body, like some squishes or like pulling kind of massages to the body before an oral thing um, to see if that then calms that, the oral system too, because it can kind of all work together. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking is like if the child will even play with food or, you know, like put their hand, like I would start there rather than just bringing it to their mouth. So will they tolerate playing with it? Will they tolerate moving it from the plate to a bowl? Just interacting with the food before I ask the food to come to my mouth. Yeah. And, and, I mean, and then another question for that family would be like, 
have they ruled out all the other things like is the child having reflux is the child uncomfortable after they eat is that why they don't want anything in their mouth like is there something else going on that would cause the child not to want something in their mouth mm, it's really good yes yeah. lots, lots of questions about You're right. <laughs> it is always very challenging working through things with our kids that are things that they have to do to um survive like eat sleep use the bathroom yeah. like those are all things that are really difficult and that our kids will will immediately see control over because there's nothing ultimately that we can do um we can't force those childs the child to do those things so i hear you it's really that's really difficult um another question we have is could you please speak a bit about suggestions for beginning feeding or solids for the first time beginning feeding okay um we do so have a feeding it. we do have a feeding therapist that we're going to have come on the extra connection soon so you all can get excited okay. about that <laughs> um because yeah, i know that's a huge huge topic and i don't want to say the wrong thing so i'm like uh i would almost hard. defer and i know that i have you know coming from the parent role i've i've been like is this an ot thing is this a feeding thing and sometimes they kind of go hand in hand and sometimes yeah. it's more than one than the other so um i think mm -hmm. i would say um hang on to that question and come to our feeding therapist um um yeah program that will be coming up unless there's anything else you have to comment on about that no really i just knew like in general so in general not for down's population but um pediatricians and in my experience just letting the child have taste really small taste here and there to introduce flavor and texture and that sort of thing um, but as far as like exactly which food to start with or how much or whatever, I would defer to a feeding therapist. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, a couple, a question that had come in through email, which of course, because phones are great, my phone decided to time it out. So I'm going to have to go open it up real quick. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so if you, this person, now this is a general question, but this person says that they have some challenge, challenging moments with their twins. One kiddo has Down syndrome and one, one of them does not. And is there anything um, that this person would like to know mm -hmm. that any do's and don'ts about comparisons um, when it comes to comes to the two kiddos um, and meeting their, meeting their milestones? Hmm. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, but I, I don't have a child with special needs, but I think even, um, I think that's a struggle for any parent maybe is to compare even the oldest to the youngest or when this one did that and this one's not doing it and, and that sort of thing. So, um, I think I would just take the, the, mile, the general milestones that I gave you keeping an, um, knowing and understanding that it might take a little bit longer for a Down syndrome child to do the same things. It might not. But then if you really in your heart feel like, oh, they should be doing this by now or um, or if thinking about, oh, I think their strength, I think their decreased strength is impacting them not being able to do this, this and this, then at that point you would know when to seek out um, help or something like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That is really hard when the comparison is side by side like that. Um, and I think to go with your gut is definitely a good call on that. Yeah, that, that was our final question for the evening. Um, I'm so, so thankful that you were able to come. Thank you for being such a wealth of knowledge for us and for so many families. Um, I just want to encourage everybody here, if you have not joined the Extra Connection group on Facebook, please do so because that's where we'll be posting the links to all of these videos and also any other links that we have to notes or other things that we that come up as resources we'll be posting in that group. Please feel free to share that with anybody. Um, we're so glad that you all were able to come. And next time, 
oh, it's a treat. I'm excited. I'm always excited when we have all our presenters. I'm so thankful. Our next presenter is um, a special education early childhood teacher, and she's going to be talking to us about the importance of play with our young kiddos. So we're so excited um, to have Sarah with us, and we hope you'll join us. We'll be sharing that information soon. Um, and again, thank you so much, Julie. We're so glad you were able to come tonight. Yes. Yes. Thank you all for coming on and yeah, hanging with me because I know I was talking super fast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.